Okay, Three. let's start now. Hello, welcome everyone to the New York Chin Society first inaugural composers meeting. This is the first time that we are having a session devoted to the Chin players who have composed pieces. So what you will be hearing today will be new music, essentially, on the traditional instrument. We assume that you know that the Gu Chin is the seven-stringed instrument. You'll see each one playing their own, and in many cases, an instrument that they ha themselves have made. So I would like to introduce now Pe Zhang Peio, our president and organizer of the meeting. And I will be co-hosting this with, on the screen you see his name is Mambo, but his name is Andrea Le Leo. And we Hello will... everyone, I'm just a timekeeper, so you will not hear much from me. We'll be introducing each of the speakers and Peyo has a few words to say. Zhang Peyo, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, thank you, uh, Marilyn and uh, Andrea to help for host and also Ralph host a Zoom meeting. And thank you everyone to participate this Yaji. Uh, so now uh, the program has a little change. The second one was supposed to be planned to let Jane to talk, but now we will move Shui Shan earlier to the second one because Shui Shan will leave at 4 p.m. And at the end, we had John, but John couldn't join today, so he will join next week, next Sunday. And we have another Yaji next Sunday as well for Qing playing. So now let's uh, welcome Stephen to present his work. Stephen. Okie dokie. Um, hello, everyone. And uh, before uh, we uh, we met, uh, there was uh, for like the week, last week and a half or so, there was a conversation going on among the various people who are presenting. Uh, and we got into a lot of interesting discussions. And one of them had to do with uh, the nature of music that uses tablature versus music that uses uh, pitch notation. Uh, we were talking about standard notation, but I think that the same uh, differentiation would apply to any kind of tip pitch notation. So the difference is, uh, can be described uh, from the uh, uh, user's point of view, um, is that the tablature shows you how, what, where to put your fingers, basically. And tablature is used, has been used for uh, various instruments. Uh, it was uh, very early for the um, uh, for the Guchin and also for the uh, pipa, but in the West it was used for, uh, for instance, the lute, uh, the organ, and uh, guitar, and lots of other instruments uh, going back to in in both of the case both in the East and the West uh, it was used in the um, uh, used in the from the well you could say from the uh, medieval period uh, through the uh, to the Renaissance and continuing on till today. Stephen, um, may I interrupt you? When you use the word tablature, I'm you... going to explain. Okay, because okay. it sounds as if tablature is used in the West like the Gu Qin, and it's very distinct. I think you should make that distinction right off, though. Hold on. Okay. Um, okay, so in the uh, case of uh, Gu Qin music, the tablature explains exactly where you put uh each finger of both your left hand and your right hand and uh, what you do with it um and in the case of for example the lute uh for which i'll give you an example and uh let's see hold on a second uh okay uh, i'm gonna do a share screen so we have the um no, i lost myself okay Come back. Uh, uh, the um, uh, I'm going to show you examples of 
uh, different types of tablatures and also uh, different types of notation. Now, uh, one thing, uh, but before I go on about that, I, the, uh, the difference uh, with uh, pitch notation is pitch notation doesn't tell you how to make the note. It just tells you what note you have to make. And it's up to you to figure out how to get there. Um, and so they they actually have it's two different ways of getting to the same place. Um, and sorry to have the momentary. Uh, oh, here we are. Okay, I lost actually Zoom. Okay, now we're ready to do a share screen. And okay, so this is an instance of a Western tablature uh, that uh, is it's. It's actually the um, it's green sleeves, and you can see in the uh, you have here a uh, a letter D uh, in a certain place, which tells you um, the letter D tells you to put it on the one two three third um, fret of the third string because it's the third line down and so forth. So the B D A coming next uh, tells you where to put your fingers. This is, um, in a way, it's a simplified version of uh, a Guqin tablature. That they're they're developed completely independently, but um, it's it's a little bit simpler. And uh, also above, you can see that there is a uh, uh, there's a ryth the rhythmic sign, so you can indicate both pitch and rhythm. And now here is a case. Uh, of uh, a Bach prelude, in this case, uh, uh, some of you may have, uh, who played piano, might know this as the C minor uh, prelude in uh, 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 and a, and a uh, uh, Bach uh, notebook. Uh, above is the pitch notation. It doesn't tell you anything about how to play the notes. It just tells you what notes to play. Below, this is for standard, this is now pretty, standard guitar notation. Uh, it gives all the strings and all the frets. It doesn't tell you anything about the duration. You can kind of, if you, uh, uh, people who use this kind of thing, uh, you usually get the duration from, uh, get the rhythm, I should say, uh, from the staff notation, if they can follow staff notation, or uh, guitarists, for instance, who don't uh, read that, usually just get it from having heard the piece a couple of times. Now, um, here's a case of a uh, uh, Li Shanting's uh, transcription of his own playing of uh, Zhou Kuang. And in this case, uh, he covers all the bases because he has um, three lines uh, basically giving uh, the same, uh, same music. The top line uh, starting uh, where it says one equals F, six, eight, five, eight. Uh, he gives the uh, pitch, uh, Chinese pitch notation uh, with rhythm. Below that is a standard uh, Western notation. And then below that is the chin tablature. Okay, so uh, this is all uh, uh, the, the uh, reason for mentioning this at all is when you're writing for Gu Qin, one of the things you really have to uh, be careful about is uh, do you want to tell the player to use a uh, standard notation uh, do you want to tell them how to play it or do you uh, uh, do you want to, do you want to tell them what he should try and project uh, which you can do very nicely with uh, Western notation what melodies you want them to project what sort of phrasing you want what sort of dynamics all of that or do you want to have him uh, play specific notes and specific strings in specific positions. Uh, and that's um, been, for me, a huge, um, to be a little crude, pain in the butt, because uh, I uh, uh, usually give, uh, I, I've been since, you know, for I've been writing music for about 50 years, and uh, I started out writing like all Western musicians do, with um, using uh, a, a standard uh, notation. And then when I started to write uh, I'm going to skip over. Uh, yeah, I'm going to skip over to an example of uh, not the piece I'm doing today, but uh, I'm going to tell how I got to a different piece. Uh, this is uh, a, a piece for um, well, electronic sounds, 
but it's it's actually all notated in Western notation, and uh, cello and chin. Uh, and in the actual notation uh, that um, that's published, I did not indicate any of the uh, uh, chin uh, normal tablature signs. I can't play from that. I've tried to many times, and I'm I'm pretty good at it. But when I'm actually uh, in in a concert hall, staring at pitch notation, trying to make chin music out of it, I fail. Um, so. Uh, at the same time, uh, when I'm playing with other uh, Western, like, for instance, when I'm playing with the cellist, we have to be able to uh, discuss with each other, you know, what we're doing together. So we need the Western notation. Uh, so what I've done is, um, I'm just going to skip quickly through this, uh, uh, is... Uh, Even I'm going to interrupt you with one sentence. For chin players, we start with chin notation first. So when you put Li Xiang Ting's thing up there, he didn't start with a Western score. He's focused on the chin notation. So I well, I, I actually I think I know uh, Li Xiang Ting's uh, practice well enough to say that that's not true either. Okay, uh, that, this is not uh, a point of argument. I just want to remind the listeners that chin players start with chin notation as a rule, and then. If they are advanced enough, they could change, translate it into Western score notation. But now I feel confused because you're starting with. That's okay. I just thought I'd interrupt. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the uh, yeah the a point about uh, Professor Lee's example. Uh, uh, probably it's useful to know that that's in uh, a, a teaching book. So he's giving that uh, for two reasons: one, to uh, uh, to teach people how to play the uh, chin, but also because in the uh, in the guqin notation and the tablature, you don't actually have any rhythm, and he wants you to play it according to a specific rhythm. Uh, but yeah, of course, Marilyn's absolutely right that uh, you need to uh, for the chin player. You really need to look at the uh, uh, traditional music uh, because that's what we all learn from. So, uh, just to give a quick example of my solution, um, uh, okay, let me rotate this so you can see it. Okay, so this is uh, uh, a section of the, uh, the part from the uh, same score that I showed you. You see, I've scribbled in all kinds of, um, I, I haven't put in the com complete tablature, but I've put in enough. Annotations. Yeah, I put in enough so I can actually, uh, without, um, uh, without having to pay too much attention to the Western notation, I can play what I'm used to playing. Uh, but this, of course, uh, it, it's, I, I think it's probably, uh, for most of us, pretty untypical to start from the Western notation. And go the other way. Uh, go into the uh, tablature. Now, uh, the piece uh, that I'm doing today uh, uh, is uh, I've, I've composed a completely different way. Um, for one thing, it was it's a solo. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was a. a Bin Lee is correct that uh, there's a 12 tone matrix and there's also uh, lots of other rhythmic things going on in that piece. Um, in uh, this particular, uh, in the piece I'm playing now, which uh, is uh, called Traveling to Lay, uh, it's, uh, there isn't any of that. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm going to go back and quickly uh, share screen again. Um, uh, Uh, no. Well, okay, I can just tell you. Uh, I've got the, um, all of the, um, I've got everything. Uh, where is it? There's no cancel. Hmm, interesting. Um, the, I've written, I, I, when I was composing the piece, I started out composing the piece the same way I, I've been composing pretty much every piece 
since I really developed my technique, uh, compositional technique, which is I start with a vision of the piece. Maybe uh, it, it's usually not any kind of complete idea of the piece, but rather uh, just some particular moment in the piece that I feel defines the whole piece. Then from that, uh, in the case of, for instance, in the uh, case of the piece I was uh, showing you, I might uh, develop a 12-tone matrix uh, that would, would help me to realize that. I might develop a, a rhythmic um, uh, organization, which will help me do that. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I will, everything I do will be in the service of developing that one little idea. The thing is that when you have this core idea, uh, it's, it's always so important to hold on to it uh, through the end of the piece. Now, when uh, I'm doing it with a, a very complicated uh, set of materials like I was uh, starting to show you, it's, uh, it, it, can be, it, it can be very, very useful because you can get totally sidetracked by all that uh, uh, mathematical stuff and lose sight of the, the, the essence of the piece. Um, okay, Marilyn, what were you gonna ask? Is that idea an emotional feeling, a sound in your head, or that's what I'm asking you to be a bit yeah. more specific about how you get that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's, and, and, and interestingly enough, this is something I actually uh, discuss at uh, some length in a, um, a class that I was teaching with a poet uh, quite, a, quite a few years ago. Um, and we were both found out that we had the same kind of idea of some kind of, usually it's some kind of sound, but it's it's a gesture, uh, and in the uh, but in the in traveling to Lay, there was another aspect to it, which was that I was kind of impressed by a uh, piece that Andre did uh, about uh, traveling, um, basically of, of, uh, about uh, a Buddhist traveling. Well, and you are going to Ladakh. Please explain that Lay is. Are you saying that Lay is? Can you stop Ladakh? interrupting for a moment? Thank you. And then I, I travel. I, it actually, uh, it's the traveling to Lay is about. Uh, I had this idea that had nothing to do with the music, except for the fact that uh, it, it involved two different musical cultures. One musical culture was the uh, culture of India, where I always when I go to. Ladakh, um, it's, it's, I think we all know something about Indian culture. Leh is the capital of Ladakh, which is uh, on the Tibetan plateau. It's the Indian part of uh, Tibet. And uh, so when you go there, it's basically, you're in a Tibetan culture and it's, it's, it's quite different. So it's, it's quite a different kind of music. Um, and I think I'm not going to say anything more than that, except for just to say that the, the way this piece was composed was, again, keeping that core idea in my mind. And then over the course of uh, a month or so, just working out uh, ideas that would work that I could keep in my head along with that other core idea. I scribbled them out on a single piece of paper. Um, it's, it's, it's very simple what I wrote down. And then I just developed from that. and. Uh, the piece is um, what I, it's, it's no more complicated than I can remember. So it's, it's uh, quite a bit simpler in a lot of ways. Um, shall I play it now? Would that be okay? Please, yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, and then uh, if there are any more questions, of course, we'll get to them. Okay, so. Here we go. It's actually, um, I changed the title to Traveling to Ladakh because um, there are some, a, a lot of images in here, uh, but none of, there are none of Lay. <laughs> we actually, uh, uh, and it, it is more about traveling uh, from India to Ladakh. Uh, and the first images are in India and then, well, you, you'll see. And also, I, I have to give you one bit of warning. Is a, a rather quiet section towards the end, uh, where when I was recording it uh, yesterday evening, 
uh, uh, although I'm in a very quiet area, um, some people drove by in motorcycles. <laughs> so you'll get that that little bit. Uh, since we are the New York Chin Society, I guess uh, 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 having some extraneous noises uh, should be something we know how to live with. Okay, here we go. Traveling to Lay, traveling to Ladakh. Thank you. 
I could have mentioned that uh, the um, the instrument I was playing was uh, not a guchin; it was an electric guchin. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. You brought us on the trip. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. That's really interesting. It was fun. The bass notes really are important in evoking the chanting that one hears when one is in the temples. Is that true? Uh, there's some noise. We don't know who that noise is from. And I think it's 3.30 now, so we have to move on for the next presenter. Stephen, thank you. It, it silenced me completely. <laughs> it's 
Shreshan, Yu Shreshan will be playing next. He has a class at four, so he will be. He's on mute. He's on mute. Okay. Hi. Um. Can I? Should I start talking? Yes, please go ahead. Oh, okay. Hi, hi everyone. Um, great pleasure um, here to to share my own composition, and uh, thank you, Peyo, for your invitation. Thank you, Marilyn, for the great organization. Um, <clears throat> so today I'm going to present um, um, one piece from a series I wrote uh, called The Heirs of the Fifteen States. Uh, ever since my childhood, um, I was struck by the great beauty of the, the book of the poet, uh, Shi Jing. Um, and after I started learning Gu Qin, I also learned that, you know, Confucius used to use Gu Qin to play with the recitation of the book of poet, a uh, book of uh, poetry, uh, Shi Jing, you know, 300 pieces. And, um, uh, presumably, you know, he was using Gu Qin, you know, like what we learn from the the Ming Dynasty, uh, Gu Qin song, that, you know, one word for one note, uh, that kind of fashion. So, but uh, um, I start thinking about, you know, the great beauty of the words in the book of poem, um, and the great beauty of Gu Qin. Certainly, you know, I don't think playing one note for one character that can kind of chin song it has its own beauty but i kept thinking how could gu chin you know just as a solo instrument as a, is creating that kind of instrumental pieces that can um you know not rival but at least capture some of the beauty in the pure words i like something that is pure i don't like combining words with uh, music. I like to appreciate the pure beauty of the pure words in the book of poetry. And I also like to appreciate the pure beauty of just a Guqin sound. Um, and indeed, I think Guqin has the potential to capture the imagery and the sound, you know, the um, book of the poems from from the um, from Shi Jing is very rich in both visual imagery and uh, acoustic. Uh, you know, there are bird sound. You know, the very first one is acoustic, right? Guan Guan Ju Jiu is the the bird sound, and then um, you read Zhong Gu Lao Zhi. You know, the bell and drum, or the Qin and the Se. And it is also rich in, in color. Um, there are studies of different plants in the book of poem and, and different utensils, etc. and etc. So it's, it's very rich. And uh, I think Gu Qin um, has the potential. So that's my first thought. Um, pure instrumental Gu Qin sound capture some of the beauty of those pure beauty in pure words. Second thinking, you know, I, I agree with uh, both Stephen and Marilyn um, in the significance of um, fingering, right? Uh, like Marilyn uh, said, you know, Guqin student start with the Guqin traditional notation. It's the fingering. I totally agree with that. I think that is really the core, the spirit of Guqin. Uh, it is richer than any other notation. No notation can capture the richness of Gu Qin Jian Zi Pu, the fingering. Every pitch notation is a simplification. Every pitch notation is a simplification and impoverishment for the Gu Qin Jian Zi Pu fingering notation. Because when Gu Qin Jian Zi Pu tells you to do certain movement, 
there are a lot of um, something I call designed unexpected. Some sound are not expected, not uh, consciously produced, but they are designed because of the movement. You create a lot of sliding, a lot of kind of percussionist sound, and also a lot of additional sound. And because the way you touch the string, for example, you do guan fu, you do guan fu, no pitch notation can capture that because, you know, when I press my hand on the fourth string, my thumb is loosely touching the fifth string. So maybe accidentally touching the, the sixth string, so the sixth string might create a harmonic while the others are, are uh, open string. And the fifth string is only loosely touched, so it created a kind of a um, not bright, but that kind of that kind of sound. And then um, the sixth string might accidentally produce a harmonic, and then the other strings are and are um, open string. And then the fourth string I press on the ninth way, it produces that. So those are accidentals, and uh, sometimes they produce, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they come out, sometimes time they don't. So there, a lot of those effects are unexpected, but I would call it a designed and expected. Right? It is designed so uh, you can let the player produce those sequence of the the notes in a different way, and it will produce different um, unexpected or you know, if it indicate you after you play this, and it indicate you play a chua on the ninth way, so you have to slide down lower than the ninth way and then come back, and that create a very different sliding. But if it tells you to play a ju, then you don't produce that, right? So those are not cannot be notified in any pitch notation. It is. Um, not in your consciousness, but uh, I would argue that that unconscious, uh, you know, unexpected, accidental effects are somehow designed. You can design that. You know, if you play according to the fingering, then you would produce some of those um, accidental, kind of unexpected, unnotif un um, unnotable um, effect. So I, I totally agree um, that Jian Zipu should really be the key. So um, <clears throat> that's why in my um, 56 Guqin studies, uh, the book I published in 2019, in the introduction, I raised the concept of fingering motif. Um, we know that in Western music, uh, there are motifs, there are themes, but when we talk about you know the motif of bang 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 bang, so it is it is pitch, it is it is certain melody, right? It doesn't matter which instrument produce it. It might be produced you know um, by the horn or the strings, um, you know, or you know the the um, the flute. It certainly doesn't matter how you produce it on your instrument, but fingering motif is different. Um, it is. It has nothing to do with melody. It has something to do. It has everything to do with fingering pattern. So, um, and my Guqin studies focus on those fingering motif. For example, um, <clears throat> you know, this is a fingering motif. So um, it might produce a different thing. It's a different melody, but it's pretty much the same fingering motif. If I pr pr produce it on a uh, ninth way, so it's a certain kind of uh, combination. And uh, you can also, um, <clears throat> it also doesn't matter how, what rhythm you give it. Uh, 
um, it's a uh, it's okay too, right? And um, so my idea is, you know, I wanted to use this fingering motif for the poem I choose from the book of book of poetry and limit the number of fingering motif. Like in uh, Western music, you know, the, 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 the melodic motif, you, know, you can have development, you can have um, contrast, right? So the fingering motif, I use a certain kind of fingering pattern, limit the number of fingering I use in a certain piece to give consistency and um, uh, harmony to that piece of music and then try to explore different potential of that fingering combination. combination. So basically, <clears throat> it generates sometimes the melody you don't recognize, but uh, you still feel um, it, is, it is just a uh, scattering kind of material of, of sound. Uh, so basically, that's the technical concept behind the composition of this. So it's called the Heirs of the Fifteen States because all the poems are chosen from the Feng part, the Feng Ya and the Song, the three part of the Book of Poetry. But, you know, I choose those from the Feng, that is air, the air of the Fifteen States, which is mostly collected from the countryside, while the Ya and the Song are mostly um, ceremonial ritual music played during the um, sacrifice to ancestor to god kind of more um, ritualistic um, and uh, i composed some of them and some of them are collected in the uh, study of fingering because each one um, kind of focus on a a type of fingering trying to explore the potential of a certain fingering motif and uh, some of the pieces are just using harmonics and some of the pieces use a lot of uh, yen, uh, for example. So, um, and the one I'm going to play today is the, um, the very first in the book of poetry, Guan Ju, uh, Guan Christ, the Osprey. And um, so, um, well, I think I, I might play first and uh, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the, that poem, you know what imagery, what sound are in that poetry, and see if um, if I somehow capture that, or um, or not. So. <clears throat> Um, I, I just heard um, the kid. I, if you if you um, excuse me for just five seconds, I will tell them not to open the door and to to break in. All right, during my playing. As some of you can see, I'll speak while Shui Shan is away. There is an active chat going on about how to use the word tablature, and I only wanted to interrupt Stephen to say that. The word tablature should pre be preceded by Gu Qin tablature, so that we don't get it mixed up with the tablature of Western notation. So I just use tablature exclusively with fingering, and Treshan is calling it fingering. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, because I, I, you know, uh, after playing for a while, I noticed that there are a lot of um, patterns. You know, it's, there are a lot of similar combination of fingers is, that appeared in many, many different. Uh, for example, you know, everyone might have played um, Qiu Feng Ci. So, um, and then it goes up to the nine, five, five, fifth string. It's the same thing. It's just a play on different string, playing using the same fingering combination. So I call it fingering motif. Um, and uh, so um, and um, I also use that fingering motif concept to analyze Gucci music because once you 
you find out what is the typical fingering combination in a piece, you notice that it is everywhere. And there are just different variations of that same thing appearing again and again. And it produced very different melody. So it is very different from the, um, the standard music motif we, we talk about um, Beethoven or Mozart. Okay.
Beautiful. Oh, thank you. It's, it's so, um, I um, I wonder if um, someone recognizes some of the um, imagery or or sound of that um, of that poem. I was wondering, uh, is it a completed work yet? This composition. Um, yeah, um, this is the um, of this piece. Yes, the whole series, of course, has how many twelve something. I didn't write for all fifteen states. Uh, I choose a few. So um, and um, um, seven of them, I think, is published in <clears throat> in in my fifty six studies, and this one is one of them. So um, the total um performance of the whole series might take like um half an hour so this is the like the opening piece and it's also the first poem in yin shi jing and the reason this... why i'm asking because uh when i you were finishing up i didn't recognize that that was the ending of the section or the piece so it didn't end like a conventional chin piece so i was wondering is it supposed to directly connect to the next piece or is it standalone in other words yeah that's the idea so um i basically i sequenced um sequenced the um the series so the next one um it is it is indeed so it is it better to connect with the <clears throat> the next one um it's called the next one is the cedar boat uh Bojo. um so it's called the cedar boat um, that one and um, so, so yes, um, but um, um, I did intend to, yeah, maybe it's not a full cadence in the Western terminology. It's a kind of a, a half cadence. And uh, uh, it, 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 yeah, I, I didn't give it a sense of like a full completion. Uh, so I think you are totally right. You feel, you know, it should be picked up by something. Well, it's continuous. It's part of a suite, is what you're saying. Right. Yes. What, what's clear to me was the, the sense of folk melodies in it. You have rhythmic structures and um, themes that are very comfortable, very, very familiar. I mm. didn't have the poems in front of me, so I'd have to go back and look, mm. at, and look at your pool. But I just yeah. loved it. Everybody, the reaction is very positive in, in all the oh, chat. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, thank you. <laughs> yeah, um, maybe you know one. <clears throat> some of them, um, like the poem, talk about um, a gentleman thinking about a beautiful lady, and he he toss on the bed, cannot sleep. Right, Zhan Zhuan Fan Ce. So that's one word verse in in the poem. Uh, so he, he toss and turn uh, in the bed and cannot sleep. Um, so um, the first part of that part, at, you know, when I composed that part, I'm, I was thinking of that section, like this part. So it's not as rhythmic, it's kind of has a lot of hesitation and had some kind of a um a uncomfortable kind of that kind of, it's not very smooth basically and then um the poet another image in the poem is of course the bird the os ops, uh, osprey uh guan guan and uh, that is basically this part so um 
uh, if you are familiar with the Mayan school, you know the Mayan Ping Sha Luo Yan has a lot of mimicking of the the geese cry, and it used the same fingering. Basically, it's basically uh, creating two um, same note on two different strings. So when you slide from one string to the other to try to produce the same sound, you create that da 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 that kind of thing. So I I basically uh, was inspired by that Mayan Ping Sha Luo Yan to use that to give a hint to the bird cry. So that's that's a bird. Um, and then uh, in the poem, there's also Zhong Gu Le Zhi, Zhong Gu, the bell and and, uh, and a drum. And that is basically when um, I start with the loose and free rhythm very slow, and then it get rhythmic. When it start getting rhythmic, I uh, start start every measure, you know, if there is a measure, start every measure with a cuo, and that cuo give you a feeling of uh, zhong, you know, the bell, bronze bell, and then the yan give you a feeling of drum. So that's where this come from. So that's the Zhonggu. Uh, so try to, it's also contrast from the first and second section uh, in getting rhythmic, getting kind of more standard kind of a 4-4 four, four beat, uh, give you a sense of uh, regular beat and, and that thing. And then um, there is also the image of the, um, the water. Uh, so because Guan Guan Ju Jiu Zai He Zhi Zhou, so there's a river, right? Zai He Zhi Zhou, there's a river. So, and this is a river, basically. So that's uh, the river, and um, maybe it's a kind of a re very regular flowing river. So yeah, that's that's basically some of the concept. Uh, yes, Marilyn? Well, Peo is reminding me that it's almost 4 o'clock, but I want to say yeah. one thing. Just as you prefaced your piece by saying that music can be, it can be inspired by poetry and words and imagery, but in the end, it still stands independent. Right. That's what's so amazing, I think, about Gu Qin and Gu Qin Pu. What mm -hmm. is actually coming out of your hands and the sound in the instrument is unique unto itself. And regardless of what inspired it, that's mm -hmm. how I feel. I think someone can listen to the music and just feel it as, I mean, the complexity of all those fingering uh, is understandable to someone who plays Qin but it also is understandable to someone who doesn't play, I think, if people will comment. I agree. So, totally thank agree. You. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Your student is now waiting for you. It's <laughs> almost 4 Yeah, I apologize again. Um, so, um, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Susan. Very nice. Thank you. So, Jim, our next performer, we want to welcome as a new member, or shall we say a veteran chin player of long standing, but a new member to New York Chin Society. And he lives Thank in you. Seattle, right? Or please, Portland. Portland. So, Jim Binkley, welcome. The floor is yours. Okay. <laughs> um... So I'm going to play a recorded piece. Actually, Peyo is going to share it for me. Um, so just to talk about it a little bit. In the past, sometimes when I was learning a good tin piece, it somehow inspires me to compose a good tin piece. Hasn't happened very often. 
And sometimes when it happens, I don't like the result, so you're never going to hear it. But a couple times it's worked out. And this particular piece actually um, was sort of a uh, companion piece for a while for me for playing Wine Crazy, Joe Kwan. So Joe Kwan has, actually has something to do with this piece, whatever it is. Don't try to read the tea leaves directly. It's a very indirect thing. So the title is, it actually, the title in Chinese and the title in English is different, but it, to me, it's the same idea. So um, the English title is Journey to Hawaii. And to me, the feeling for this piece is sort of like the peaceful, mellow feeling that I get from a Hawaiian slack key guitar player. Now, having said that, it's about feeling, but it's not about technique. This piece doesn't have much to do with guitar playing, even though I am a fundamentally a guitarist. And uh, the Chinese title, on the other hand, is Xiao Yao So if you can channel, I, you either fly to Hawaii or you fly to Peng Lai to relax, but that choice is up to you. One is a little more physical than metaphysical, but there you go. And, uh, and Marilyn, because you sent me that nice email, I want to point out that Xiao Yao Yo, there's actually an esoteric meaning here, which is that was the name of Wang Zhenhua's chin. Oh which is a really nice Qing Dynasty chin, as I remember. And um, so what else? So I don't know. I think when, once it's played, I'll just say a few words about the some things that are in the piece. It's, it's not long. And uh, it's a, as a video, I played it on a chin that I made. That's a, the first time I ever tried to make a Guchin top out of spruce. So basically, this is a Guchin that possibly wants to be a violin because it's a spruce maple Guchin. I might, I, might say, I might say one thing about that. Maple is actually a pretty darn good tongue wood. It ends up giving a certain um, separation of sounds. So like when you play um, dyads, xiaozuo, something, dazuo, something like that, two note chords on the gu chin, it tends to make the, the two sounds a little more distinct. I've noticed that. Maple, and maple is actually kind of famous for that. The other, the other thing is spruce is a, if you haven't heard spruce before and you think it doesn't sound like polonia or shanmu, you're right. <laughs> it's different. But I have made three, and this the one in the video got sold last January to a nice young lady in Vancouver. So, that, so this, this chin has gone out of my life, and I'm kind of sad about it because it was my, it was a, it was, actually it was the first good chin I ever made with a clear finish. So. So you can definitely see the wood. Okay, Peyo, you're on. Okay, hold on. <laughs> Let me close something here. Okay, so I'm going to share this screen.
So does it, oh, well, should I say a few things about the music itself? Yes, yes. I have the score for this. If somebody wants it, send me an email. But um, actually, it's it's in the it, even more the elementary. Group. The Gu Chen group on Facebook has a file section, and people tend to not know that. But if you look for files, you'll find many, many, many files. And that the, the sheet music for that piece is, is one of the one of them in there. So anyway, um, a couple of things to say about it are just I've been fascinated off and on of for, because of the just major third Gu Chin Hui. In other words, six and eight and what three and twelve. You know, they're all the same note on the same on the string. And that's a just major third. And it doesn't get used very much in Guchin playing. It does get used sometimes. The first time I ever encountered it was on the what um John Zomundia piece. And it, and it's used in there actually for to sort of give you an eerie atmosphere at the at the beginning because he's dreaming or something like that. And uh, I felt that if I played, which is basically linear on the same string, and from a soul phase point of view, it's do me so. Okay, so it's you know it's it's basically the the wonderful Western triad of C E G. I mean literally, but um, there's a it sort of gives the the piece a, a it's it sounds good i mean if you're old enough whoops wrong you might even recognize that from you sitting in front of the television when you were five years old in 1955 that's the nbc call sign yeah. so <laughs> what i remember is very distinct is Da 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 dum da 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 dum. You have that repeat motif, and then you yeah, have a five. You have a five one structure. Bum 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 bum. So I actually, I didn't want to get into that with you, Marilyn, because in closet, my background is a jazz musician and a blues guitarist and that sort of thing. So this actually is mostly a blues, but technically, it's a loose. And I can, I basically, you want 12 bars, I can make it 12 bars. You want eight bars, I can make it eight bars. I'll make it 10 bars, whatever. You know, it's just, I've been doing I've, this piece I've played way, way too long. The other thing is it has, there was a compositional problem for me. It was minor and I solved it very badly. But the problem was that this, this piece actually has triads in it. And it's a moving voice, but there are three note chords. So when, you know, it's kind of a joke, but when I thought about trying to do that, I thought about using the um, Dotswell Durfa with, to have a two car garage, add, add one. So you, so, so you could basically explain three notes as opposed to two. But instead, all I actually ended up doing on the Durfa was piling the notes up as separate things you know, because it's basically a what? Um, go, mo, thumb. Okay, so that's basically what it is. Well, I come from Hawaii. I was born in Hawaii. So I hear a lot of slack key, whether it's guitar or ukulele or what. And usually music um, can be danced to. It should be danced by some hula form and I thought listening to your piece that actually the gourd would be a great accompaniment you know the, <laughs> the gourd <laughs> because the rhythm is slightly unusual and uh, for who dancers it's better to have a regular rhythm anyway you're getting a lot of comments especially you about the this? instrument you see this it looks like it's Chinese but it's actually a Hawaiian surfing shirt <laughs> <Okay. It's okay. laughs> There's some chin makers out there who have commented on your instrument. 
and I also wondered, of the color, whether the sound was influenced at all by your, usually it's, on traditional instruments, it's a, a, a lacquer, but you're using a different kind of glaze. Does that affect the sound at all, besides the wood? Um, I'm, I'm probably, I don't want this to lead to an argument. I have inflammatory opinions because I am a luthier. And my opinion about finish is it just damages the sound. But you have to do that, especially with the good chin, because otherwise you're going to damage the instrument. In that particular case, this gets back to thousands of years ago with someone named Stephen, when we were able to use cashew lacquer, and that was clear cashew lacquer from Japan. So and cashew lacquer is used a lot in China. I've actually seen Guqin now being sold in China that look like they're stealing from me, but I don't know that. <laughs> but, but the problem with cashew is it became unattainable because Japan changed their export laws. So we can't get, we can't get cashew from Japan anymore. And that's, and since I still want, I still am interested in trying various woods and clear finishes, I'm, I'm still trying to do that. And I don't, and I think it's probably twice as hard, if not 10 times as hard for various reasons. But the, the thing is that when I lived in Taiwan, actually, you know, I lived with John and John and I both took lessons from Yeshertan on good chin making, including um, lacquering, mostly lacquering. And that's, it's not hard. If anyone ever wants to actually learn it, I can teach them. It's not hard. But the, the clear finishes are, are a, uh, a bigger task. And I, did I answer your question or did I get off the rails? Well, there, there are chin makers out there who work with lacquer. And someone out there is also, Shungit, has made a... Shungit, tell me, what is the, the name of your chin? Carbon, you made a chin out of carbon fiber. Yes, carbon fiber. So, I mean, there are people who are interested in your process as well as your music. So that might be another another session <laughs> because <laughs> we don't have enough time to go into chin making. But several of you composers are chin makers, and that's the traditional, also part of the tradition. So you, you have four minutes, actually, if you want to stay in, in tune. Did yes, you... uh, one of our guests, uh, Danny, also made his ching himself. Danny, are you there? I see Danny's comments. Yes, I'm, I'm there. I'm here. <laughs> Any questions or comments to, to Jim about chin making? I know you used his um, translation in your bio. Danny mentions Danny has an extensive website with all of the pieces that he learned, plus his process of making uh, making. Yeah, chins. thanks to uh, Jim's translation, I was able to 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 kind of you know reference the manual. I'm I'm done. You can you can move on. Well, there's three Unless more minutes. Danny, if you want to say a bit more. Well, I've got um, a very basic question if anyone wants to move on. Uh, how hard is it to get started uh, setting up a workshop for chin repairs or making, considering that we can't get lacquer? Who are you and where are you? Hi, this is Uni in Toronto, Canada. Oh, Uni. Hi, Uni. It's ironical that I don't know your voice, but never mind about that. I'll get over that soon. Um, you can buy lacquer from Japan on Amazon. Okay, so they actually banned cashew lacquer from exporting, but you they actually allow lacquer. For allergic or original urushi. Japan banned dachi. No, no, I'm wrong. Japan bought banned yaguchi. And why they did, I don't know. I have no idea. They, you know, they make the usual claims. It's, but for some reason, dachi is okay, and you can get it in all known forms, including some that are probably 
known only to Charles. That was an in-joke for Uni and I, but oh well. Thank you. Someone okay. said, yeah, she's on the from Taobao. I don't know what that is. Whose comment is Taobao that? Taobao is an online shop. You can okay. buy it from Taiwan or from, actually the stuff from Taiwan is also from Taobao. And you can get it in different ages. For example, the younger lacquer is more liquid. But if you buy something that's maybe one, two year old, it's been dried a little bit. So it's supposed to be a better quality. But in fact, it's the same. It's just one is more liquid. The other one is a little bit older, drier. But you it's can't buy it from China because it's not, they don't, they won't export that to the U.S. Oh, you, can't buy, just, you can't buy lacquer just, from China and you can't buy cashew from Japan. Actually, when I go to Asia, I just buy it and then I put it in my suitcase because it's not something that's uh, like uh, inflammable. So, but I've never tried to mail it, but uh, I think if you mail it as a, as a package, maybe, I don't know. I've never mailed anything like that. Well, I see this is part of the, our chin making workshop because the, <laughs> the lacquering in, in Asian art, how one lacquers is an art in itself, regardless of whether it's on the chin or not. So I can see that this is another extensive discussion plus sourcing. And it's the same kind of lacquer. It's the same yeah. lacquer, the stuff you put on the um, Yes, the same, but how you do it. In Japan it, and in China and all parts of Asia that have lacquer, it is a, a very exacting art form. So <laughs> thank you so much. We got, I, I'm afraid we have to move on to Andre. Andre, are you ready? Andre is a very special. I'm here. Yeah. yeah I'm here. Because he is a left handed chin player. And, or shall we say, you're still right handed, but you play left handed. And you have a spe <laughs> very special piece. Um, yeah, I have. With a poem. Yeah, that's it. And I, I, I think I can to not to take not so much time. I can read uh, two short paragraphs about the piece. Uh, that piece, the name is Cao Yue Zhen Mo. I think <laughs> say like that. And in English, Beyond Silence uh, came from a dramatic event in my life. A uh, house cleaner friend widow at the age of 35 lost her 50, 50 year old daughter to undiagnosed meningitis who died suddenly. By that time my son was only three months old. Deeply moving, I went to the funeral and discovered that the relative still needed to raise money from to pay for the wake and the burial. Being from a more vulnerable social class, I walked to the building administration without saying anything to anyone. Once there, I learned that the burial schedule was full that day, and so it was necessary to pay upfront for a reservation tone as soon as possible. So I offered to pay all the expenses and felt relief my friend would not have to go through the pain of seeing her daughter displaced to another funerary house. This is very dramatic for me because I know her for 10 years and all the time we talk about uh, her daughter and very smart, very, very dotted people with a lot of future. And uh, I remember that I'm in a traffic in my car in Sao Paulo and they received a phone call from her to tell me that his daughter uh, is in hospital and died. Uh, so, so, so suddenly, but I, 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 I think I, I received a shock because I, I cannot understand why. And she doesn't yet. Um, oh, anyway, and I go to the funeral in the next day 
a so so sadness for all people a lot a lot of people uh, from her community crying you know it's just, and i kind of very sensible because my my son has not six months three months two months and uh, anyway and when i come back to my house at night i sit in my desk putting desk and play some notes and and do that do that yeah, i think it's very very good for me because i can express my my, my feelings in that day and so I uh, start to play and feeling more and try to understand the, the motifs and the, the stories and the, what, what, what I need to express in that day. So, to, to make short, the piece is from 2017. I'm still working in that piece. This is a finished piece, but some parts I really... Uh, feel the need to change, but right now a, I'm quite happy with the final form. And I uh, wrote a poem in two in English about that day, and I read the poem, a poem from Amanda, that the name of the daughter. Two time spaced heartbeats, raindrops falling from another sky, dampened the light dust in her eyes. Is there a morning mirroring face out there that would be mine? Beyond the flocks I see, they lay down this shadow path. The swept dust will float in this time gap, or might be my own trembling thoughts that show the voice into the heart. Uh, this poem is related to the, the first note of the music and the uh, kind of rhythm and structure maybe I can talk about after the piece. But uh, I can say this, the two times spaced heartbeats is the first harmonic note on Chin. I think you can recognize it immediately. And the raindrops and also the the same the same notes. Let me play.
bad connection. It's all right. We yeah. we really appreciate this piece, Andre. Yeah. When you composed it, maybe others have some questions. I'm. Yeah, sure. It's it's a beautiful piece, and especially knowing you answered the question of how one composes. You began with a feeling, but you heard yeah. sounds, that, and you had certain yeah. chin techniques in under your fingers. So, did you improvise first on the chin and then notate it? For example. Yeah. I Yes, I kind of do that. I I try to follow the path of Qin, follow the sounds that uh, they play to me. It's a kind of strange that it's all like that, but when I play, I don't know, one, two open strings or a harmonic or a slide, I try to pay attention and do not judge the, the, the sound that came to me. It's not so easy to speak because most of the time we, I don't know, I, I, I talk by experience with my students and music students. Uh, most of the time we feel the need to control events, to control music, to control sounds, motifs, and put them in some kind of specific order or a kind of structure. Uh, I call that the kind of analytic, analytic sense of music, you know, uh, a tendency of all composers that I have to teach uh, was quite the same. Think about, think about, think about all the time. And I kind of reverse that kind of action and do, I try to do not think in so much, to not make some some statements about what I'm doing, just listen, listen and try to feel. And sometimes I have a kind of glimpse of an uh, image. I don't know, uh, several things and I can manage with these feelings and perceptions. Yeah. So after I do that, I put them in some order or try to make some kind of combination. The different way to do it. And that's why I send the, the, the other texts about perception and music and composition, because I found very, very fundamental and uh, give up some control of music sometimes just to understand music, understand Qin, understand the things that came to us and you you know, <laughs> you can do not pay uh, so much attention. <laughs> That's it. So, in that line of thinking, Andre, would it destroy yeah. your music if I asked you to say, put in a very traditional Guqin intro and outro in the sense of a modal cadenza? Because yeah. it's convention. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And... Uh, Question is, or <laughs> are you it's just a, a statement? Sure, sure. That was a question. You mean, it, I'm not sure what you're asking him to re to add those or maybe. Yeah, because to the traditional uh, churny style composer who would like to see some kind of convention or tradition to Guqin composition, uh, new songs always sound somewhat incomplete to them. Oh. Yes. Yeah, I think so. so I think so. Yeah. I they're always so looking because... for that intro and outro. The clue to, is it over? Is the idea finished? <laughs> I always get this when yeah. I and listen to new compositions. So I go like, hmm. Should we be doing of, uh, just to respect the instruments? Or no, we're doing this because we want to strike a new era. <laughs> I think it's not that. I, I think that uh, I can, how can I say, we have a dis discussion in classical music, classical Western music, why a lot of music starts with a very slow tempo, a very, I don't know, subtle sounds in orchestra, chamber music, and, and why every student do that? And in general, I think French students, German students, and 
Brazilian so uh, and it came that question why I cannot identify the f the beginning and the end in the parts uh, uh, we have a, some clue about that uh, in our time contemporary time the way we feel time I think that the, the question is about time not about formal structure of music and we can walk through poetry or music and you see the same question or, or even uh, movies cinema with scenes incomplete and we have an idea that the mode of thinking in music western or contemporary composition are quite uh, endorsed by our experience of time and what is that what is, what is the experience of time in our era we think uh, more discontinued <coughs> continued parties we feel that time is a kind of hyperlink you click in some text and go to another without finish the the last one and goes by that this way in my case, I I leave it open, uh, and uh, it's not a classical Chinese piece. It's just a piece of mine that uh, is in consonance of my personality, my identity. I don't know. This is difficult to risk to answer that. No, you've <laughs> answered it. It's an open, open-ended thing. I I think what Uni is asking is. Um, not necessarily something you have to reply to musically. Yeah. I think the, to me the piece sounded complete because your idea, your concept was motivated by feeling. And that's why I asked whether you improvise. Yeah. Because improvising, yeah, no. you, the sound and the motions come together. I, I mean, jazz pianists or musicians, yeah. they are it's all one unit. It's not saying, oh, I'm going to do this or that. It just comes out and their technique has been there ready for them. Is that true for you? Yes, a little bit, but uh, I improvise a little bit, but not all the time. I try to uh, catch some things and do it two, three, four, five, six times until I see another thing another music this is improvised i think so i think so because improvisation is more free i think the musician play and give it away <laughs> what he plays just after <laughs> you don't think about the first phrase the first note because most of the time you just forget <laughs> and i do not do that it's an interesting uh, question to think about it, I think. Um, there are <laughs> some developed. questions on the side. Shungit, do you want to ask or Stephen? They've at, uh, written them into the chat, but they can ask them out loud too, to, to you. Yeah, yeah this, uh, Baroque, ah, I think that's the nature of all music. Doesn't all come from a shared vocabulary? Yeah, uh, yeah came from a uh, shared vocabulary. Uh, first, I think the pieces I studied on Chin and my listening, my listenings uh, of music in general. And yeah, I think so. I think, I think not Baroque, but, but when we studied a lot of things, I, I, that's my, my, my point. When you study a lot of things, a lot of composers, a lot of pieces, all of this is kind of mixed together inside of you. <laughs> I study a lot of classical music and contemporary music, some very kind of things that are novel, medieval music, chanting music. Wow. And, you know, you kind of make a big mixture of that. <laughs> and I can trace anymore that oh, this is Beethoven, this is Bach, this is, I don't know, this is Qin music. I mean that uh, oh. classical Guqin music and its composition, in a sense, is very dogmatic 
in its use of yeah. theme. For example, you choose a certain tuning or a certain mode because that mode is assigned to a certain feeling or theme, which is, of course, replicated in the same way with Baroque music and the keys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And coming from a very classically trained Guchin player, uh, sort of that drags over to me and it's uncomfortable for me when it comes to dealing with new music in that sense. Well, you have to listen yeah. to more, Uni. <laughs> Indeed. That's all I can say. Yes, you make a wide, a wide vision for, yeah, I know what you're talking about. I'm from Western contemporary classical music that mm -hmm. my fellow colleagues, just some people do, this is not music. Simple like that. Oh. If you have a motive or a regular rhythm, this is not music. Because you need to uh, compose uh, equal to the major composers in a university. For, for example, very dogmatic. You know, if you, uh, some guy uh, play a triad, you know, do, me, uh, G, sorry, <laughs> C, A, G. In, uh, in classical training in university, uh, very European, the, prof the professor say this is completely wrong. Don't, don't, don't do that. <laughs> it's quite dogmatic too. You know, this is absurd because we do not uh, do this kind of music anymore. So I don't think like that. And must, but I recognize that in the Qing universe also, because I think we shape our sensibility to recognize just uh, a very specific set of music and concepts and the other the, the other rest is outside and quite sound like strange things in music but i think it's a little bit wrong this is my feeling <laughs> i think we can uh, open wrong. Our, i agree andrea i think we can open our ears to <sighs> more types and and that's the purpose of this session yeah, to hear different compositions, and yeah, you need to come from one standpoint. But I think <laughs> I, I think standpoint, but uh, to finally correctly classify and periodize uh, oh, the difference yet. between classic wait, and modern wait. composition. Okay, wait. We don't need to classify and periodize yet. Let's listen first <laughs> and listen more than once. <laughs> <laughs> Andre, we need to continue this at the next composition session. And okay, thank, thank you. you so much. It was beautiful. Thank you. And thank you. It was much more than a piece of music. That was the point. It was a, a whole incident in your life. And that is another yeah. thing I'm impressed by how much music is a whole part of your, your life, your daily life. I think that's true of everyone in this group. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Marilyn. <laughs> We're going on to Bin Li, Li, Li Bin, who will give a very different concept of time and rhythm. Hello. So, thank you, Andre. <laughs> Li Bin, you are nice. on. <laughs> okay. All right. Can you see my screen? Can you see my screen? I know. Yes. Oh, okay, okay. All right, so, um, yeah, I just want to say thank you, Andre. I think I, I totally agree with you on lots of points you made. Um, I think for myself, I was not, I was not talking about this, but I mean, since you guys mentioned about. Um, for me, the attractiveness of the Qing music is really to uncontrol itself, because, you know, because I'm trained as a Western musician, there's always too much control, especially in contemporary music, right? Contemporary contemporary composer he has tried to control so much and i think through Qing music really uh, you know tell me uh, help me to free myself um, to express myself and uh, to uni's point it's funny because um i do i do think i think for for learning Qing playing there is in Qing tradition it that uh, it has um you know it's very do dogmatic and uh, like what she said you know it's like you certain mode and certain um, certain thing you have to be done this way in in a traditional senses, 
Um, but I think within the limit, there's also some sort of freedom. And also, I think it depends on how, com how composer chooses uh, his or, or her own styles, I think. Uh, okay, so uh, just a side note here. Okay, all right, so I'm gonna uh, pre uh, present my own compositions. Um, uh, I would present three pieces of mine. Um, so the first piece is untitled for Qing solo. The second piece is to hear for Qing and various instruments. And the third piece is Banse for Qing and dancer. Um, so uh, I wouldn't, I don't have time to play all three pieces. So, uh, so for, the, for the first two pieces, oh, I will introduce all three pieces, of course. But for the two first two pieces, I will only play one minute excerpt. And for the last piece, I will play in full. So uh, the first piece uh, is in Chinese called Gu Feng Wu Ti. Um, it's untitled. Uh, this piece is actually, uh, you know, is I try to learn from the old master. So this is completely almost in the same style, in the in the ancient style. Um, so this was was written uh, last year for the twenty years anniversary of the New York Qing Society, uh, notated in. Uh, traditional notation in ancient style with traditional form and harmony. So it is notated every I don't know if you can hear see. But this is notation. Um it's in Wu Qing tablature. Uh what is that is a tool? I don't know. Sorry I didn't put it in the screen. But um but this should show uh, so I think this piece is more for me um a, a homage for the old composers or old master whose name usually lost in the Chinese history. Um, for me to really to uh, abandon all the Western knowledge. Oh, okay, I'm learning Qing. I'm learning how composer was thinking in the past, how they compose using those tools to compose. So for me, it's almost like a, a study of a past. And I respect all the rules. For example, what uh, you know, what you mentioned the mode and the gestures, and you know, all the in the ancient style. So for example, this piece again, study with start start with a harmonic. You know, like like many of the pieces, you know, Guqin pieces start with a harmonic, almost what Andre described as a raindrop sound, right? Um, so the opening of the Zhengsheng part is start with this motif, I shouldn't say motif, but this gesture. So the middle part of this piece has on U mode, uh, which is So those are the uh, as and play. So uh, as we can, we, you can hear, I completely respect uh, the traditional way of writing um, in traditional style, and um, from the melody to the harmonics uh, to the timing. So the only two twists in these pieces are I use harmonics. Um, you know, some some dots I really use. For example, uh, the eighth dot and six dot I really use, so I explore more on that. And also I use some harmonics uh, beyond all 13 dots, like some 11th partial, like this sound, which is it's a harmonic sound, but not in either of the 13 dots. Okay, so that's the one um, thing. And the other, th the other feature, I guess, is um, not like, sorry, somebody's playing. Um, so, uh, Unlike the traditional pieces all in one mode, so this piece is almost a journey from one uh, cycling through five different modes. So uh, for me, because I was this past year, I already studied uh, the, the modal preludes of many Qing handbook. So for me, is a thought of a journey or also a study to cycle through the mode. So start, start from the Tai Tu Gong, which is tonal center on the second and uh, seventh string and it ends up in Zhong Lu Gong with the tonal center on the third string. 
So that's the end model. And that's the beginning. It started uh, on those NS here. So, okay, so, so that's the first piece. Um, too bad I can only play a snip. Um, so if you want are interested in listening to the whole piece, you should go to last year, the New York Teen Society at, and 20 years anniversary, the last piece uh, of, uh, to listen to the whole piece. So the second piece um, to hear for Qing, uh, various instruments. So in contrast to the piece uh, was, you just heard uh, as, uh, as you heard in completely in ancient Chinese style. And this piece I really tried to, wanted to integrate uh, the Qing philosophy uh, as part of my own compositional style. So, um, you know, so the first piece, the, the core of this piece is actually is another solo piece and called America is hard to hear. Um, so as you can see, this is notated in traditional score, right? Um, so if I, if I just show you this screen, you probably don't know what it is about. But now I can tell you is literally a recompositions of the uh, Star Spangled Banner and the American Anthem. So, but if I did, didn't really tell you this, um, you know, you probably wouldn't really recognize it. Uh, we'll listen to the recording later, um, which is actually part of my attention. So um, there are three reasons in this. Uh, the first reason is uh, this Anthem is through the process, you know, through Qing actually, um, is played very, very slow and almost one note at a time to the point that one cannot recognize uh, the anthem anymore, right? The second is the piece is played entirely in harmonic. If you can see, I don't know if you can see my mouse, the cursor entirely is in function in, in harmonic. So the harmonic has its own uh, its distinct quality, almost like a sound uh, from far away. Um, so the third, um, it is, if you can see here, the third string is tuned a little bit out of tune or a little bit a quarter tone higher than very regular D. So a it's tuned a quarter tone D sharp, which is between D and D sharp. So that some note of this piece will sound a little bit out of tune or a quarter tone sharp higher than its original. So uh, therefore, so um, through this recomposition of this process, uh, the re regular heroic anthem is somehow transformed into a, dif uh, a different animal, I say, uh, you know, we, which is really sounded. Uh, this kind of echoing my, uh, you know, my thinking of the, the Taoist or uh, Lao Tzu's phrase, Da Yin Xi Sheng, and the greatest music has really sound. And it actually matches the title, America is hard to see, uh, to hear. So which is also inspired actually by a poem from uh, Robert Frost. Um, one line is called America is hard to see. So it's obviously there are layers of meaning uh, behind these pieces, for example, like political or philosophical. So I, I, I wouldn't get into that here, but I think it's, it's very obvious, you know, so because, because I used the anthem. Um, so after talking about this solo piece, now um, I did another recomposition of that solo piece. So, so the piece become two here. So uh, from a solo piece become ensemble piece for Qing and uh, various instruments. So um, various instruments here is really means any instrument can play this score, can join as an ensemble to play the music. So what's different here, here for the, this is uh, here on uh, the bottom side is notation, a uh, Western notation for, uh, for the ensemble playing. Um, so what's different here is uh, different than Qing is, it is uh, you know, a fragment from an anthem, but the ensemble also play in different situations. So you can treat it like, okay, so we have the material from the anthem, but I, we play, diff the ensemble play differently according to my instruction, Impro and almost a little bit improvisation quality. So uh, for me here, really, uh, the composition is to, to guide through the player to, to play this uh, open, op almost open-ended pieces. So I would say you can call it almost like a, anti-concerto, you know, concerto is like chain and the instrument uh, orchestra, but anti means that this is not really in the uh, concerto form in Western senses. So uh, I think I speak too much. I wanna play a little bit, you know, again, one minute uh, from, from the first performance uh, I had in London 2019. And uh, you can listen to the whole pieces later here in, my, in, uh, in the link here. So uh, again, so it wouldn't sound like American anthem at all, although it is from there. I will play one minute.
Oh. Okay, here, right? Is it good? Yes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. All right, so yeah, that, that, that's what I want to play because it's just, you know, one minute because uh, otherwise we don't have time to talk about other pieces. All right, so if you want to listen to the whole piece, and the piece is quite long, uh, it's 30 minutes, um, you know, because the piece has no beginning, almost no beginning, or oh, less beginning, uh, let's almost open-ended. So um, you can play as short as 20 minutes, 10 minutes, or two hours if, if, if one ensemble wish to play. Um, so, so please, let me talk. Uh, Li Bin, please mm -hmm. explain that concept because <laughs> they are not hearing the whole piece. So, uh, actually, for I, I was, can I explain it after? Because I want to, I do want to move forward to the third piece very quick. Um, sure. So, okay, so let, let me explain it after uh, because I think maybe I talk too much. Uh, I do want you to listen to the entire piece, the third piece. Um, before I go back to this uh, open-ended pieces, okay? So the third piece is, is called Banse, uh for Qing and Dancer. Um, this piece is, was created, um, it's actually a COVID uh, quarantine piece. Um, it's inspired by the quote um, by Pascal um, from his book, Banse, and all of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. So. Uh, I won't, again, for the sake of the time, I won't talk about much techniques here, uh, but I do want to mention that uh, another dimension when I composed this piece, uh, I not only composed for the sound, the music itself, but I also uh, curate, if you, you wish, or compose the concept um, of, of one person sitting in the room and how this dancer should move. You know, it's, it's this situation I'm when I composed, I also, in my mind. So, um, Okay, let me play the whole piece here. Hope you can hear this, the sound now.
Okay, that's the piece. Okay, um, so one more thing I do, I do wanted to mention. So this piece, uh, I, I discussed with the dancer the situation uh, I wanted. Um, he actually chore uh, choreographed the whole thing, um, but we discussed the several moves, potential gestures we can do. Um, for the for the music side, I also uh, amplify. You know, one thing another th uh, another thing Gucci music really uh, fascinates me is actually the percussive sound. Sometimes, right? This is kind of in a taboo in a some, some somehow in a Western music before 20th, 20th century. But also this sound, right? It's very interesting. So um, I kind of amplify that use the guitar slide sometimes. That's where you see the sound. Uh, the side slide so um so that's it so um so let me answer marion's question on that open form um so this piece the the 30 minutes piece or i mean it's open-ended pieces is is all from the fragment of the american anthem so the players can play um okay i already mentioned the ensemble for the for, for the solo piece the 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 chin part is played exactly as same as as an American anthem, and he or she can play uh, whatever he wanted, actually. It's, it's in improvisation mode, but the player should recognize he's almost like a soloist. He actually, the sound from him or, or her trigger the whole situation. Now, after this happened, um, so the, the ensemble and even the audience member can join to play this piece by speaking one word from the anthem. So for the ensemble member, they have different situations here, but this is, 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 I mean, this is a lot of details I wouldn't discuss here, but uh, the, the key is the ensemble, uh, ensemble player, for example, viola, violist, he can pick and choose from the, from, the mel from the melody here and from even a fragment or even a long phrase or short phrase is okay and play, um, you know, it, it's up to him or she or, or her to play in different length and different uh, duration. But because already Qing, uh, as a Qing soloist, you set up the mode to play right away. You we are in this space of these situations, a very spacey situation, so that if players recognize this feeling, right, so he will naturally improvise from this, uh, I would say, spirit or or, or or this atmosphere. So so that the piece is it is from Qing. Um, but but this feeling somehow is conveyed um, through the score or, or, or conveyed through the the air, the vibration of the sound to to the heart of other players, so they can feel 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 how to express themselves, uh, giving the material from the anthem, right? So that um, so that the dynamic is not a problem for me because as long as because you know I I know people start asking okay how do you control the dynamic with Qing and other ensemble right? But because Qing already start the first, uh, you know, it start it start the piece by Qing. So other ensemble player will naturally try to match the Qing sound. Okay. So that's a point. Right. That you set up the rhythm and a certain uh, atmosphere by right. those opening notes. Right. Um, someone who hasn't heard the whole thing doesn't realize that each performance will be different. Yes. Each performance is unique, and totally that different. is open open ended. Right. Um, and is is um, okay. each one is different and can you I mean, stop language. sharing? Oh, okay. Uh, st I stop sharing or start sharing? Stop. Stop. Right? Oh, stop. stop. Okay. We had some <laughs> quite a few reactions about pensee, so maybe you can address them. People oh, okay. like it. People so like it's, it. The... it's okay. not very pleasant, though. It's like COVID for me. It's a powerful piece. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, so what's your question? So, sorry, so which one is your answer? <laughs> Maybe you can just speak to me directly. Um, Satsuka, Satsuka, Shizuka, will you please express what you have? I can't find your comment. He really well, I said it. I felt like I lived through the whole thing emotionally with the whole display from boredom to anxiety to feelings of memento mori. So, yes, well done. Thank you, awesome. thank you, thank you. So uh, one thing I would like to mention for this um, is actually you see actually the, 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 the player, sorry, the dancer inside somehow is controlled by me, right? Sometimes the dance move is 
sometimes interrupt by the harmonic, and sometimes it's synchronized, sometimes it does not synchronize. So that's something um, you know I plan in the piece as well. And also the dancer has has uh, you know the time it, it moves very very little, but but because we we give the space of the, I mean we give the sound the space and, and the movement itself you know even very tiny movement you can you can feel. Right? So in the end of the pieces, actually, I don't know if you realize, the end of the pieces completely become a picture. I don't know if you realize, because before that, you can, you can see he's, like, he's uh, blinking and, you know, he's moving. But after he walk out of stage, um, you know, become entirely picture. It become totally still. And that's how, you know, I ended the piece. But actually, without, without me to giving the, um, give you the timing, the, the space, let's you know the the feeling of this kind of space you know it's, it's sometimes sometimes hard to um, to let audience to uh, perceive you know the very small moment uh, movement I think so um, just a, dif a different different type of time experience I would say huh? yes that's important however you are correct in that whenever there is sound it is creating space that is absolute in dance yes. And, and I think that that's why I learned a lot um, from the Chinese uh, Qing philosophy, actually. Because I think a very important part is uh, the, the philosophy is to listen to the, to the sound appearing and disappearing into the silence. And I think, I think that the, the important part is not just the sound itself, but is the disappearing, this process <laughs> of disappearing into the silence. You know, so that gives a space uh, you know, this is why I'm very interested. Of course, you know, lots of composers do not agree with me, but uh, this is why I think my music has uh, has become more spacey. You know, because I, I I come from very uh, control freak environment for contemporary music uh, in the past, but uh, I think that's what Qing music uh, taught taught me. Um, you know, and through study the the older pieces the same. So actually, I kind of wanted to play the old pieces e even slower tempo, but again, it's a different interpretation. So. Um, so, the uh, quality of the note matters for Guoxi music, and that's what you brought out of it. Not Thank only you. that, I think you agree with Andre. Yeah. There is, I say it again, the, the notes create, the reverberation requires space, and therefore it creates space. Right. And whether it's loud or soft or diminishing or whatever, there is always movement and so the dancer has to feed into it it's just that the dancer was extremely uh, angular right <laughs> trying to express yeah hope. the covid yeah exactly so yeah so there's uh, another layers there too yeah exactly yeah i think you gave us a whole, totally new experience and Thank definition you. of sound and space Thank you. and, but, and, and I, th I think that this concept is quite old i mean it's in the in the literature in the Qing philosophy in the past, it just is new in a way that is presented in the kind of modern way, I guess, right? But I think that's what composers for, um, I don't know, so. I think only John Cage preceded you, his no, concept. I, I don't, I, probably there are other composers, so sorry. Well, <laughs> yeah, no, they John, are not other. Uh, John Cage was one of the first in terms of yeah. modern historical time. Right, but there are actually other composers before John Cage as well to do this kind of thing. It just. And, yeah, it's not, it's not really hurt, I mean, hurt. Um, yeah, we need to hear about history. It. Let's do it for the next session. Okay. <laughs> hey, yo, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you all. Thank you. I will try to answer your question um, privately if you have other question. All right, thank you. Thank you, Bing. Hey, yo, and her ensemble is waiting in the wings. Thank you, Li Bin. Now we've been waiting for Peyo's Ensemble, your unified Gesamtkunstwerk. You can say that you have a total harmonious composition with chin, words, music, and the visuals. So you've put it together in the most remarkable way. Okay, yeah, right. Um... Right, let me share share my presentation first. Um, before I start, I, I just want to, for myself, I just want to 
kind of make clear what is the definition of composition. So I, I put a dictionary explanation here. And the, the number three is the ar arrangement of artistic parts so as to form a unified whole. And so I think uh, in Chinese, it's 艺术性的组合排列以形成一个统一的整体，可以是音乐、文学、艺术的创作。So I think it's um everything you you put together as an artwork is a composition. So it's not just music; it can be literature and art. So today, um oh, before I move on to my piece, I just want to give a little brief. What I did before, uh, I composed my first Gucci music in 2008. Uh, the, this is from um, a screenshot from my website. Uh, the, the first piece I composed is The Great Nature is Waning, which was a pure Gucci piece. And during this 13 years, I wrote several new Qing music composition uh, list here. Including a duet with Shakuhachi, chain with nature birds singing, and a composition based on the natural rhythm of water drops, or arrangement from ancient and modern melodies, such as those purple dots. Today I'm going to show my most recent composition work, which is a music movie, Jue Shao, Melody in Jue. This composition work is not just about Qing music arrangement with xiao and vocal, but also recitation, visual movie, and images. Jue Shao was a flute tone in the Jue mode. In the Chinese Jue is like the Western tone Mi or La. Most of the musical pieces in the Jue mode have the ending note or major phrases and the final note blend on Mi or La. And Jue Shao was composed by Song Dynasty poet Jiang Kui, uh, who lived between 1155 to 1221. This song was said to be in the mode or scale of Zheng Huang Zhong Gong, the orthodox Huang Zhong Gong mode, which is similar to um, Western Lydian mode with one sharp on the fourth note of the scale or the half step, half step is between the fourth note and the fifth note. The original music notation used the Song Dynasty popular notation, Su Zi Pu, which was designed for fingerings for the, lute, uh, for the flute. I have briefly studied three interpretations from Ms. Rulan Zhao Bian and Mr. Lawrence Pekin and Mr. Yang Ying Liu and one recording from Ms. Liu Chu Hua from Hong Kong, where the pitches are a half step higher than Pekin and Yang's interpretations and one and half step higher than Bian's interpretation. Hmm. Okay, so how did I decided my pitches for Jue Shao? So this is a chart of Song Dynasty popular notation that Zhang Kui was using. So here I use the red color highlight the Huang Zhong and the Gu Xi. Huang Zhong is like Do, Gu Xi is like Ni. And the symbol here, you see like a triangle with the open on the top right and the Chinese number E, uh, that's the, the Su Zi Pu notation. So then um, this is the Song Dynasty Su Zi Pu. 
if you can see, this is the Jue Shao lyrics in Chinese. And then on the red line, on the right side of the red line is the Su Zi Pu, uh, the popular notation of the Song Dynasty. So I use the red arrow to point out the Gong, the, uh, the Huang Zhong and the Gu Xi here, which is on the Chinese character, the Chinese lyrics, Rao and Jing. So then I use Lawrence Beacon's interpretation and uh, uh, Zhao Rulan's interpretation to find those two notes. Okay, so uh, this one and this one is the Rao and uh, Jing. Here, Lawrence Beacon is on D, uh, A, B, C, D, D, like Ray, and then, so Ray as the Huang Zhong, and Gu Xi is the uh, F sharp. But uh, Zhao's interpretation is different. So Zhao's uh, Rao is on the C, and but the Jing is also on the C. So uh, I kind of doubt about Zhao Rulan's interpretation. And then I also checked this chart, which is Song Dynasty Zhang Yan. Uh, he made this chart for the 84 Diao with seven Gong Lu and the 12 pitches. So I, I found here that the Huang Zhong Gong and the Zheng Huang Zhong Gong Jue is listed under the D. So that's how I decide that my Huang Zhong will be on D. So, so this is the tuning of the Qin from first string to seventh string is La, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, La, and Do is on the D. And the scale is uh, D, E, F sharp, F, uh, G sharp, A, B, and C sharp. Then, okay, so that, that was my uh, Gu Qing fingering notation on this piece. Then at the end of this piece, I add a little melody myself. Uh, so this is my rough notes for the fingerings of that short composition, the sh a short composition I added to the end of this piece. Um, I have to write down the notation. I cannot just write down the pitch or the melody because I have to know where I can play it on the chain. So writing down the fingering is more useful for me than just write down the melody, uh, the pitch. And before I start, I just want to read this Zhang Kui's uh, preface of this piece. He wrote, in the spring of the year, Jia Ying, I accompanied with Shang Qing Yu, uh, who was a friend of Jiang Kui, used to live at the town where West Lake is located, and to travel to West Lake to look at plum blossoms at the west village of Gu Mountain. Jade like snow was reflecting. Wind blow out the thin fragrance. Now Shang Qing has returned to Wu Xing. I came here alone, mountain covered with spring fog, fresh willow dipped into water, tourists blend in with flying flowers. I feel disappointed with the sense of loss, therefore composing this to convey my missing of friend. Shang Qing is good at singing with refined ornamentation. I like to compose songs and to play with bamboo flute. Shang Qing then sings alone. That was full of the atmosphere of misty forest. However, Shang Qing left to take an official job. No more fun like this anymore. So before I play, I would like to thank my husband and my good friends, Eve, Renjie, and Hongmei, and Renjie's daughter-in-law, Sonia and Homei's husband, Mr. Su, without their contributions and helps, this movie 
couldn't be produced. And I hope you will enjoy watching and listening it. Because of the spring, I am worn thin. To bear again, to go. Where everywhere are weeping willows. From gazing at the peak beyond the mist, I remember being with you on the lake, hand in hand. You went back not long ago. thousand acres of fragrant red have fallen early. A leaf-like boat crosses wavy mistiness, traversing the thirty-six imperial lodges Causing the traveler to turn his head. Still, they are on pleasure boats, those who screen themselves behind their sleeves. Green towers, where with fans athwart. Each shines on the other, striving in loveliness. Bright kingfisher tail diadems gleam. With care, they apply the palace yellow paint. But at the present season. Spring is like the past. My unsettled spring heart is like wine. Writing for the silk of wool, I play to myself, asking. Who can explain the intention of this song? The friend who once was with me in the presence of flowers.
We've had wonderful comments. Everyone loves it. And especially oh, thank you. Especially the credits at the end with the harmonics. Because we have a chance then to hear your your chin. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I I before I wasn't sure where that little melody I should put. Maybe <laughs> in between the two times or maybe in some part of the uh, lyrics yes. sticking to, yeah, but at the end, I, I feel put at the end is the best way. So yeah, that's everything to me is a composition. Like how are you going to put the picture and the movie along with the lyrics, like try to make the lyrics more visualized. And then, yeah, it's it's a lot of work to, I've spent like a whole month to work that eight minutes movie. We don't realize that until you tell us, but it's so beautifully coordinated that everybody felt it. Look at all the- Thank you. The ending credit uh, harmonic section is what? Uh, Composed using basically the same mode as the yeah I I don't really have any way to think about how I try to do it I just feel put my hand on the chain and play around you know listen to Jiao several times and feel okay what kind of music will come out into my mind and then I put my finger down and try to play it. And then write down the note, the fingerings, so I can remember it. And I changed several times, and that's the, the, the final one there. Jiang Kui's works have been, or Jiang Kui's works have been uh, attempted to be transposed onto Guqin by many, many people. How did you uh, come to your uh, working out the tunings on the instruments? I decided myself first, um, I feel like harmonic is the most important part. If I want to play some notes on the harmonics part, how can I make it sound on the chain? So, so then I just turn the chain, the string tighter or looser to match my the, the, the pitch I want. So it's not a regular tuning. It's just basically, 
fa do re mi fa so la. So it's not like the first string and the sixth string is one octave. It's just like a scale. Oh. Mm. It was great. Um, always, Peo has great sensibility she, when she works at things. It's really nice. Oh, thank you. Um, you, are, you are improvising like a jazz musician. You you want, uh, you have I a thought, certain sound in your head. I thought that's how people compose. I mean, most of people compose, right? You first have some kind of feeling, then some melody come into your mind, and then you just play around with your instrument. And then you create from, start from there. It seems to be the case, but Stephen didn't think so when he began to explain. Uh, this is not the time to mention it, but I, I think how you've explained it to us is so clear. And the result is... Um, well, um, you I have a comment to make. Um, so the, um, when I first get to get to uh, live in US, I've been in US only for 15 years, probably not as long as um, many of you. Uh, when I first came here, and I already thought that Chinese poetry cannot be translated. And also there is, you know, um, I always feel like there's some feeling cannot be expressed by the Western language. But however, then now I'm thinking, the more I understand English and the, the culture and the phrasing, you know, the rhythm from the English trans translation, the more I think it's just I didn't know about the feeling the Western language can portray. So it's, it's very different sense of a poetry in, in, in aesthetically, it's, it, it, it gives a different space, you know, it's dif different sound just by reading it. It sounds very different than in Chinese poetry. So, um, and, and I would take it back that when I first come here, I say, I, okay, I would think the Chinese poetry cannot be translated and it will, you will lose the meaning. But now, I mean, your, your video really shows the example that um, it adds a different dimension actually to, to the original poetry. And, um, and once uh, someone really understand the English culture on, from Shakespeare and you know, from this, uh, a great uh, the writer from the past, and you start to find out, you, you, you feel the, the poetry in the, in the translation of the Chinese original poetry as well. And I found it is very interesting phenomenon. And um, it's not really just one better than the other, you know? So um, it's just different style and how, how the culture, um, you know, and how, how one lives with, the, with their culture, how one understands those culture as well, so. Yeah, actually the Chinese lyrics for me at the beginning doesn't make much sense until I read the English translation. And until I made the movie, I'm totally fully understand it now. And like my husband, who is American, he, he read the English translation. He thinks the English is more beautiful than the Chinese, but I think yeah, Chinese is just <laughs> character that is so simple, simplified, but each character means a lot. So each character brings a lot of imagination, but the English is, did, did a very good job to help to understand. So I think the, the timing of reciting is so different than what you do in Chinese, yeah. Exactly too, yeah. right. You hear yeah. the rhythm, you hear the rhythm of, of English. I'm not saying Chinese does not have rhythm, but probably it's, it's a different way the rhythm of the tone, you know, up and down. But yeah. English rhythm is very different, yeah. It, it's just very different, yeah. The best translation, quote unquote, of anything will always be unique unto itself because it's the poet's or the translator's understanding of what the original is saying. It will, there will always be something slightly different, but it's per, quite personal. I think you felt that in the English translation. Right, right. And also the Chinese, also you have to kind of understand if you didn't read the preface that Zhang Kui wrote, you didn't know it's about friendship. It's not about men and women's love. It's uh, two men's friendship. And, but somehow it can also become the lovers love song. So, yeah. Poetry has, the ambiguity is quite useful. <laughs> I think that's where Chinese is more evocative than English because it leaves out certain things which have to be specified sometimes in English. Mm. 
Yeah. We need to ask everyone's reaction about how they felt between hearing Eve speak it in English and then it, um, Hong Mei singing it with flute. I mean, that is a whole different combination. It's just so really. Right. How do you feel, everybody? <laughs> it's more Chinese, I have to say that. <laughs> hearing hearing Hong Mei's voice is so important. It's, yeah, it's really two two different way of the the image. Also, her mm -hmm. timbre. She's a soprano, and Eve is this low bass. I I, I always felt that. Mm. <laughs> both are both are very. It's nice. funny because I, I I like Eve's a little bit better. Sorry, I like the translation a little bit better. English part. Mm. Well, that's the preference. Yeah, it's preference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If I had to choose, I'd choose Hong Mei, but both are beautiful. <laughs> Who's that speaking? That's Lisa. Lisa. Oh, hi. <laughs> yeah. And also, uh, making movie is very interesting to me now. First, I, like, two, like one month ago, when the flower is still blooming, like a cherry blossom or plum blossom still blooming, I, I had to do some video shots. And me and my husband went to our campus near us and they have a little pond there. So we have to collect the falling petals and he throw the petal into the <laughs> pond. <laughs> there's a wing, so the petal will fall down to the pond. So I shoot the, the whole thing as a video. And then I put it into the music. Somehow, at the beginning, it's just not that quite interesting until I make some, I put some layer of the pictures and something, some parts of, some seconds happen like, some, I mean, accidentally, not my intention, like the plum blossom photo and the petal falling, it happened suddenly and catch my eyes and I feel so excited. <laughs> so I make sure that will happen quite correctly that when the when the plum blossom is showing you see the petal falling yes you're painting a picture using the video and there's some accidents that happen and you have to catch it because your eye is what is what wants it and you catch it your video camera is your eye and well you mentioned the the, the pond the last time you had ducks or something right it's so beautiful uh, Right, that's a different pound. <laughs> that's a different pound, right? Okay, yeah. but still. <laughs> right, so I, uh, there's a little, not argument, but when Eve, sub, sub, I asked Eve to sub, submit his photo, he, he went to, uh, he lives in Manhattan, so he went to the Riverside Park, I guess, you know, on, the, on the west side of Manhattan. Yes. Lower west side. So he, he took some he took the video of the final willow tree there because he he wants to show that similar to West West Lake image in the West Lake, people walk under the willow tree. And then but I kind of don't want to use modern image because there's buildings or lights behind it. I think it's too modern, but he doesn't feel agree with me that <laughs> everything should be, you know, ancient look with our modern thing inside. But th so then I, I think, oh yeah, the in the lyrics there's urging shi ho, like uh, now the present time, the uh, present season. So I think yeah, we can you know connect to the modern time now. So so I put that at the end. <laughs> And the uh, and the uh, the flowers in a little jar. That's also submit by Eve. <laughs> and yeah, so I think that's nice too. So I put at the second part. So my first part is more. Um, I I try to create an ancient feeling at the first part. Yes. No. The flowers at the end reinforce the feeling of friendship between two human beings. Because 
when you have flowers, you put them in the vase, that requires a feeling of a human being communicating with someone else. You're not just putting the flowers in for yourself, but you want to present it to someone. That I think mm. that was lovely at the end. Hmm. I didn't think of that. <laughs> That's you, nice. Yeah. Because, so it's a spontaneous feeling. You worked with Eve about this. And the willows, didn't is it in this video or in another video? You have beautiful feeling of willows. Right. The previous piece I we did is uh, Dan Huang Liu, the yeah, hair yeah. Willow, willow, right? That was gorgeous. Is that there's a or your... there's a willow tree here in our neighborhood. It's so beautiful. I love it. But it's not near a pond. It's just on the road. So I shoot a lot of video about that willow tree in different time in the morning early when the sun comes out and then in the evening when the sun goes down and yeah so i use some of the willow shots i had i i would like to see you compose one just with one more with willows no verse just the music and the willows no <laughs> <laughs> Excuse hmm. Me. Hmm. okay i'll keep that in mind <laughs> Hmm. Comments I'm from so anyone? Good. How about Danny or um, Mam Mambo Shungit? You have everyone has written co some kind of comment. Stephen. Stephen. I love uh, Peyo's um, uh, tr translation. It's so spare. And also, uh, I, I mentioned that I, I uh, to responding to Shungit that the uh, that the spareness of the chin part. Uh, the way you uh, very simply uh, put it into the chin, uh, along with the tempo, was so meditative. The tempo, uh, yes. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, the tempo and 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 the you know it, it's almost like um, <laughs> it's almost like chant. You know, it's it's so uh, every note is it's it's very much its own thing in in addition to being uh, connected to uh, all the adjacent notes. So I found that very, very pleasant to listen to. And also, I think, I, um, you know, I, I tend to write rather fast music. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Stephen. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking maybe I'll, uh, my next piece will be very slow. Although your Ladakh, um, the rhythms were great in that. They were chanting rhythms. This is different in the sense of. Um, yeah, she had a spareness. Uh, uh, Peo's, uh, she has such a spareness that it's it's just really uh, very wonderful to listen to. Thank Jim you. and I have a kind of different approach to in our two pieces, but I mean, I, I love Jim's piece too. Well, I, I loved all the pieces. Yeah. But it, it was it was. It was just a wonderful way to end the, end the uh, meeting. Thank and you. It, yeah. So Actually, it shows how important tempo tempo is in whatever. We, it's something that we're not conscious of until. But it's really the basic feeling in the piece is the tempo. Yeah. Right. Right. Then the tempo. I would like to know how do people decide. Um, I think so, it's really personal. <laughs> personal, right. Yeah, I think it depends what kind of image you want to portray. You know, um, classical, you have to be exciting, I think, at some point. You start with the, I don't know. <laughs> no. Shake your head. no, but like, you know, the, the, the classical form, right? Allegro, always the first. No, the no. No, Beethoven, Mozart had slow beginnings. I know, I know. I know. Okay, so let's not I understand that. So that is against to you know that to use that to to break the limit, right? But in the, in the sense that when everybody in a broker time, right? So when they try start to in the concert, they start to chatting. You have to something get people excited. So I think it really depends on situation. It depends on different situation. So um, you know, somehow I I really like Stephen's piece as well because. You know, it, 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 the, 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 the image when you start to, that, that's especially the shaky, shaky image and imagine. <laughs> I really like that part. 
If, Handheld camera, you mean? <laughs> yes, and I think it's very effective. It, it really matched the music. I think it really matched the music of the especially electric king chain. You know that that moment, I really like it. <laughs> yeah. For me, Tang Song music, especially in its original score, transcribe it back out, is generally difficult still for me to interpret because uh, it which uses music, sorry, which music you 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 mentioned which music? Tang and Song period music. Well, we don't know much that much about Tang and Song in terms of tempo, do we? That's all. Well, that's the thing. Uh, it's not just the tempo. It's the fact that they use so many um, non-pentatonic notes. Uh, as they especially like to use uh, thirds and sixes so uh, so much. And uh, basically, yeah. your sorry, I'm thinking in Hui. So yeah, uh, your third Hui, six Hui stuff. So that uh, it is hard to form out uh, phrases, and when you do it. Can get rather open. That's why I tend to uh, avoid them as my projects. So I applaud Peyo for the uh, for not just the attempt, but to actually do it well. Thank you. And and I, I think for the Tan Sung music, I mean, I really like those like um, the tone, which is in the Western sense, it's kind of like uh, this one. Um, and this shows me that it doesn't. You know, um, it doesn't have to be perfect because I think pentatonic is too perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, the live you need something imperfect stuff. So that, yes, that, that's why you're talking about semitones and tritones. Yeah, and yeah, yeah I really like those. Yeah. But I mean, again, it could be just you know the personal illusion. I don't know. I really don't know what the function it has in the past. So you know, it can be for richer and and for other things, right? But um, but at least I know in the past the music is not just for entertainment. Maybe it's for some other purpose. Um, I, I feel like that. The yeah. only improvement or the only thing that I would do if I were to actually intervene and do something is to, um, because other people have had this problem also, is to actually use a chin tuning that is more mm, rational, reasonable. What's, I don't know what word we're using, but something less improvised.